Gracious God, we thank you for this day. Help us to hear with our hearts and our minds, our ears and our eyes this lesson today. May we be joined with uh, the psalmist of Psalm 8 in uh, being overwhelmed by your grandeur and your beauty and be led to praise and to move our feet to. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I remember when uh, one of the first times my eyes sang and I was up about 11,000 feet near Pear Lake in Sequoia National Park, just stunned by alpine beauty, had never been above the timberline uh, ever in my life. And it was just incredible, uh, just uh, slabs of shimmering granite carved by glaciers, framed by a royal blue sky with a carpet of emerald green coniferous forest below. Yeah, it's just something. I was with one of my very good friends, and I remember him asking, looking at the same stuff, he said, why is it s this so beautiful to us? And I thought to myself, boy, that's way too philosophical for me right now. I have absolutely no idea, having the foggiest idea why it's so beautiful. I just know it is, you know. Why don't you be quiet, and we'll get to the theology books later. I didn't say that, but <laughs> he was actually my pastor. But I didn't say that. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, but all I knew is that for both me and Larry, that this, it was just, just looking, gazing, it was just so moving. And I think a similar thing is happening for our psalmist here in Psalm 8. He says, uh, I look up at the heavens, at the stars and the moon. What are human beings, God, that you are mindful of them? This is a psalm of wonder. But what intrigues me is what drives the psalmist to wonder and to ask questions and to praise God. What drives the psalmist to do that? And it's one word, looking. The psalmist looks. And today, I want you to do the same. I want you to look at star, rock, sunset, people, your life, your situation in your journey. And in really looking, I want you to let those eyes wide open lead you to praise, lead you to marvel at God's love and grace, and lead you to move your feet in response to a call on your life. Seeing can lead you beyond what you see. This is a second in a series of sermons where we're asking the question, what makes your heart sing? And this is a question that I've uh, been asking um, of myself. And uh, as many of you know, I'm taking off on sabbatical. I hope we're going to come to the party next week because Lily Endowment is paying for the food. And uh, so that's, they wanted us to do this. And the question that Lily Endowment, as I shared with you, that, it, that gave us this grant to send me on the sabbatical, they asked this question, what makes your heart sing? And so I've been asking that of myself. And uh, I want to send you, as you're sending me, I want to send you to ask this question of yourself. What makes your heart sing? And then look at engaging those practices. I think that's a way of building your relationship and connecting with God. Last week, we looked at people. And today, I, in the sermon title, I said we were going to look at place. I, I don't want to do that. No. I want to look at, talk about looking at whatever places you're in. That's the key. And to pay attention. Really, I want to talk about discernment. Now, the real irony of this whole thing is I'm the most non-visual person that I know. I don't see anything. I just, you know, I, I'm very auditory. I hear. Um, but, you know, I, I remember one time years ago I was at a party with some friends, and then we left and, you know, been at a dinner party. It was a big event, and uh, someone said in the car, Doug, what did you think of the flowers on the centerpieces of the tables? Flowers? <laughs> I, I have no idea there were flowers on the table. You know, or I'll be with someone and say, what did you think of that person's shoes? People wear shoes? I don't know. You know, I have two pair. Who cares? You know, and, uh, but I, I notice faces. I do know that. I know people when they get haircuts. So I know everybody who got a haircut. In fact, I got one today. I realized that in the morning when I looked in the mirror. Wow. Um, but I just don't see. And I, when I really do see, though, it really gets me. And I pay attention. 
Let me challenge you to go leave here with your eyes wide open. And I, I'd like to have three things happen to you. When our eyes are wide open, they can lead us to praise. Uh, the psalmist begins and ends the psalm with the very same verse, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is a, a praise psalm. And I love the way he, uh, the psalmist frames the whole psalm with these, the exact same verse. And what's that, what's that mean? It mean, God, basically all over the earth, your name is just so great. Uh, that's what the psalmist is saying. And you should be praised. You know, I, um, I think I've shared this before, but I had, praising God did not come easy to me. And uh, uh, I, I really had to grow into that. In fact, even when I was in seminary, I did not really appreciate the uh, psalms of praise, like this one that, that we've just listened to. Um, and, and I really had to grow. And part of it was just praying the psalms and just growing up, I, I think, too. Uh, C.S. Lewis used to struggle with the Psalms of Praise. In fact, in his, he has a wonderful little book uh, called um, Reflections on the Psalms. And he has a chapter on praise. It's just delicious. It's so good. And he talks about how he did not like all the commands and instructions to praise God in the Bible. He really kind of rebelled against that. Against it. And he particularly didn't like it when it sounded like God was demanding praise personally. And he felt like that was kind of like a dictator making a... Uh, the people you rule that praise you, and he just he just didn't like it. And then he started thinking about it more and more. And and then he came to a realization that God uh, demands praise from us because it's the right thing to do. And he talks about uh, he uses the analogy of art. And he talks about a good piece of art. Uh, we praise it not necessarily because everybody else does, or because it's a popular thing to do, or trendy. No, we praise a good piece of art because. The art demands it. it. It's constituted of itself. It demands our praise. And we miss something when we don't praise the art. And not only that, but we miss the joy that the art wants to work in us when we don't praise. It's like the, the, the uh, joy is, is stopped short. Like you ever go to, a, you see a great film or a play, and afterwards you, you, you want to sell something. Hey, wasn't that great? Well, that's praise. The joy is completed in the telling of it, the or, uh, being uh, oral about it, verbal. Um, like when I'm in a museum, I'm really growing and seeing things, but when I'm in a museum, and if I see something I really like, you know, I'm always telling, gee, look at this. I get someone in our church who does great uh, multimedia stuff. I see uh, her stuff in the Carlsbad or site Art League all the time. And I'm always, gee, look. And we have a lot of artists here. And uh, you want to tell somebody about it. Remember when you were in second and third grade? And someone would come into your class, uh, and maybe showing some art. Maybe they're from another culture, and they had some colorful piece of fabric, and they pull it out, and all the girls and the guys join in too. The, the girls usually lead the way. They go, ooh, remember that? I do. I usually get tired of it after a while because I hadn't learned to praise. But you know, ooh, and they show something else, ooh, and that's it. It completes the joy. And this shall C.S. Lewis realize that God demands our praise in the sense that God is so wonderful. And when we look at creation, what a wonderful opportunity to be lifted up. It drives us. It almost demands that we not only praise the creation, but the one who made it. Um, so looking uh, 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 leads us to praise. But here's the thing. You uh, have to look. And you have to take the time to look. Uh, I heard about this one woman who went to Yosemite National Park, drove into the valley, and uh, she parked her car, and she went up to a park ranger. And she said, uh, Mr. Ranger, sir, I only have an hour here. Never been here before. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, and she said, I only have an hour. What should I do? And the ranger said, you only have an hour. Well, I go over, over in that meadow over there, sit down, and look up, and cry. <laughs> I do that too. It takes time. I want you to take time. Take time to look. And not just at creation, but at life. Michael Medved, the uh, um, uh, movie critic up in Hollywood, years ago, he had his first child was born. And, and he, he made the comment, he said, there are no atheists in the delivery room. 
I think that's true. We're led to praise. And what's he saying? He's saying you, you, uh, you're lifted up to praise God when you look at creation. So look, I don't care if it's at El Capitan or at an umbilical cord or the person who's been sharing the same breakfast table with you for 40 years. It'll lead you to praise. And secondly, I think when we go into life with eyes wide open, we're led to marvel at God's love and grace for us. This is what happens for the psalmist. I love this. I think this is the heart of the psalm. And not only is he praising God just for who God is, but listen to verses 3 and 4. He looks at creation and astrophysics, you know, all this happening up in the heavens, and then kind of reverses the thought to think about how God thinks of us. I just think it's really beautiful. Uh, verse 3, when I look up at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, now, if I was writing the psalm, I would say, man, you are a big God, and it's incredible. The universe is so huge, and all the things you do, you're just incredible. But notice how it, the psalmist turns things around. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. It's interesting. The psalmist is thinking us human beings were so insignificant compared to all that's up there, and yet we are so significant to you, God. And I think that's incredible. When we look at life, I think this is what Medved is getting at. You look at life, creation or person, or just where you've been in your journey, boy, you can, you can see how important you are to God. You know, I think this also happens when we look at, um, um, that can happen in the delivery room, it also can happen at a mortuary, in the midst of tragedy. Even when we're uh, caught in our grief, we can sometimes step back and marvel at the gift of what a person was to us and grateful for them to be with us. I was struck this week NPR was, uh, had a reporter in the Sichuan, am I saying around Sichuan province in China. Boy, what a week across the globe. And uh, he was reporting on, uh, she was reporting on this couple that had lost their only child, a boy in middle school, one of those middle schools that collapsed. And uh, she described how they had made an altar on their kitchen table, a bowl and some fruit there. And I thought that's interesting here, engaging in an act of worship yeah, and I'm assuming it was uh, Confucian or Buddhist, I don't know. And uh, engaging in an act of worship in the midst of profound loss. And I have no idea what it's like to lose a child. I, I have. Some of you know that. So I, but I, I, and I can't even imagine the grief, but I can imagine that in the midst of the numbness and all the questions, that one might be open to being grateful for the gift of the life that was and realizing how precious life is. Tragedy, when we look at it, can help us marvel at God's graciousness and God's love. And it can lead us to new steps in our lives. I'm talking about discernment. Going to a deeper level in what you see. Really seeing beyond the surface. Um, Lewis Meads is a professor. I love my book. Lewis Meads is a, was a philosophy professor up at Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, uh, in his book, a pretty good person, he shares about a situation. It was just in the Pasadena area, and he was driving, and, and a situation came upon, kind of routine. But he stopped and he and he did something, and he does some reflection uh, on this, uh, talking about discernment. He says he calls it a moment of grace. The moment of grace comes to us in the dynamics of any situation we walk into. It is an opportunity that God sows into the fabric of a routine situation. It's interesting, we usually think of the catastrophic or the seismic as being an opportunity for us to step forward. But he's saying, no, the moment of grace can come in any routine situation. That, that's how God sows the fabric. The moment of grace is a chance to do something creative, something helpful, something healing, 
something that makes one unmarked spot in the world better off for our having been there. We catch it if we are people of discernment. Discernment, seeing. And this leads me to the third thing that I think eyes wide open can lead us to. I'm already talking about it. It can lead us to a calling and an opportunity. The psalmist talks about this in his psalm. You're going to miss it. And I'm going to read it again so you can catch it. But you're going to have to pay attention hard. See if you can catch the calling, the opportunity uh, for the psalmist here. And the psalmist doesn't use the word calling or vocation or anything. But see if you can catch it. And I'll pick it up in verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you take care of them? There's that introspection again. And then he goes on, you have, yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Did you catch the opportunity there? It's a stretch, but it's right in. It has to do with when the psalmist talks about you have created people to have dominion over all the earth. We're called to take care of creation. Now, there is a lousy theology of dominion that sometimes creeps in in Western theology that we can do with creation whatever we want, rape the earth all we want. And sometimes you see it, and certainly we've seen it in history. But that's a mistaken theology. To have dominion means we are placed on earth to play, to be in the position of God, not just to play God, but we represent God. And what does God do with creation? God takes care of it. This is a passage about being green, taking care of creation and doing it well. That's a calling. And there are other callings as well, but this is an important one. Now, the problem with us is we want to move beyond being stewards of creation, and we want to be sovereign over creation. We want to move from being the gardener to being the god. We want to move from being the custodian to getting the crown. We can't do that. We've got to take care. You know, I was really fortunate growing up. I had a family that was very green. My conservative Republican parents, they were the first ones to ever have a solar water heater in the mid-'70s. Can you believe that? And I remember growing up, this, back in the 60s, we were never allowed to litter. You couldn't leave a mess behind you. And in fact, I remember one time I was 10 years old and I was on some Little League bleachers in Oceanside, the old Little League field right near Mission Avenue, back in the Paleolithic era. <laughs> and uh, Stephen Studders, a really kind of a cool guy, we're sitting there, we're 10 years old, and uh, he was eating a Mounds Bar or something, and he threw the wrapper on the ground, you know, right beneath, beneath the bleachers, and there was a... A uh, trash can just five feet away. And he had some pockets in his pants, for crying out loud. And I was kind of blunt. I was even blunt back then. I said, what are you doing, literally? And he was so quick. He said, well, you know, if we don't do this, then the people who have the job of cleaning up, taking care of the grounds, they won't have a job anymore. <laughs> well, that, was a, that was a great introduction to the great lengths of human rationaliz rationalization that we can do. I like what saw the psalmist in Psalm 8 says. Boy, let's praise God. It's a wonderful world. And we have a job to do. So I want to challenge you to look, and not just at creation, but at that. Look at Batakitas Lagoon and Pana, but make sure you look at children walking to school, the 84-year-old man in the checkout line at Vons in front of you. What you look at, what does it demand of you? What is the calling and the opportunity for you at your own line? One of the things that was frustrating this week for me, and I don't know if it was for you, I have a feeling it might have been, the whole situation in Myanmar, not only the catastrophe, the, the uh, natural disaster, but the bureaucratic red tape, the autocratic arrogance that puts a roadblock in the way of people trying to respond. I mean, Presbyterian, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and Church World Service, we're ready to go in there. And yet it's blocked. 
Last week we had someone at the first service pray, God, soften the hearts of that government. I was praying right here, God, bring them down. Soften would be better. <laughs> soften, I didn't say, soften would be better. We don't need more, 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 more chaos there than already is. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what it's like because we have a call. And that's what I think looking discernment does. And it could be a routine situation. What is it asking of you? You know, it's interesting. I haven't talked much about Jesus much, but I was thinking about the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And that hymn is asking the same thing that this psalm is asking. It's asking us to look. And when we look at the cross of Christ to praise God, to marvel at God's love for us, and to hear the call. That love on the cross demands my life, my all. And uh, I want to challenge you to look. Well, that's, I don't really have a good ending. I'm just going to end right there. You look. That will make your heart sing. And it may even make your feet move. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for, for eyes. Open them. Help us to see not only who you are in your creation, but your love for us in our lives. And may we hear your call for us and to us into the future. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.